Hi, welcome to another live stream of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. The Global Network was created in 1992 to stop the arms race from moving into space. You can support the show by clicking on the like button and subscribing to our uh, YouTube channel. And also check out our website at spaceforpeace.org. We thank uh, Global Network board member Will Griffin for doing all the tech work to make this show possible. Our guest this time is fellow organizer, Ken Jones from North Carolina, a longtime friend, a former Mainer as well. He helps lead the War Industry Resistors Network. Ken, welcome to the show. Why don't you start by uh, telling us a bit more of, about yourself, your teaching career and, and such. Hey, Bruce, thanks for having me. This is great to be on with you. And um, yeah, quickly, I was a teacher at one time and another time and age. Uh, I was a middle school teacher for a while. And then uh, I moved into being a professor, educating people who were becoming teachers. I was a teacher educator, worked at University of Southern Maine right there in Portland. And uh, yeah, that's as much as you need to know, I think, about my teaching career. People may want to know that I have had a long history of being an anti-war activist uh, stemming from my draft resistance during the Vietnam War. I was a draft resistor, got drafted and didn't go. And I should say, I believe the first time we ever met was at a protest in Portland, Maine, and we both had the same sign, exact same words on it that we uh, wrote ourselves. And that kind of brought us together in that moment. So uh, it's been a great friendship. So you and our show producer, Will Griffin, and I together went to Jeju Island in 2016 for a peace march around the island. Would you please share uh, your thoughts about that experience and about where you see U.S. military po uh, policy in the Asia Pacific heading these days? Yeah, Bruce, that was a wonderful experience. It was so touching and uh, and informative. I mean, you and I and Will went there to be part of a peace walk around the island. And uh, I think you had done it before. And it, uh, I had not. And I learned a lot about the role of South Korea in uh, you know our war machine and also about what was happening right there on Jeju Island. They were building a naval base. Uh, and it's finished now. Uh, but uh, people there in Jeju were so uh, well organized and so persistent that uh, it was a lesson to me to see those organizers uh, in motion, putting on the peace walk and standing there in resistance against that naval base. Um, I also was super touched by the people themselves and developed, you know, a love for the place and a love for the people and you know, now knowing people who are right there in South Korea, which is at the, you know, the spearhead, one of the spearheads in our confrontation of China, I feel like I have a little, you know, heart and skin in the game. It's not just sort of this chess game that you look at online. You know, there's, I think people don't often realize there's real people there in Okinawa and in Jeju and now the Philippines, always the Philippines, but now the Philippines has these bases that they're going to put in, in order to encircle China. And um, yeah, so it breaks my heart to see all this going on in terms of the people there. But also, it, you know, it's so worrisome that, you know, we're aiming at China now. Russia, you know, is a stepping stone in Ukraine, although it's terrible also. Uh, but the main target is China. And of course, both Russia and China and the U.S. say we all have nuclear weapons. So what we're looking at is uh, this uh, horrible escalation into, you know, Armageddon. And of course, the U.S., as it is in Ukraine, is also, with respect to Taiwan, uh, the aggressor. It's like we plan these operations. We want these wars. And we think you know, somehow this is in our strategic interest to, you know, consolidate our worldwide supremacy. It's it's madness. It's crazy. And I am, uh, you know, as concerned as anyone with it. 
Good, good. Thank you. Um, a little over two years ago, you started organizing in your uh, in the Asheville, North Carolina area, a local group called Reject Raytheon AVL. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, this is our local group of activists. It started, oh yeah, like two years ago when we first got wind of the fact that there was a Pratt & Whitney plant being planned here. Pratt & Whitney is a division of Raytheon Technologies, which is the second largest war corporation in the world. And um, Pratt & Whitney builds components for jet engines here. They will be building them here. Moved here from Connecticut, where they have a plant doing the same thing. Connecticut's a union state. Uh, we're a right to work state. And there are other issues here, like they got over $100 million worth of subsidies to bring them here. Um, so we caught wind of that. Uh, those of us uh, paying attention to war news uh, and defense contract news and um, showed up at a B Buncombe County commissioner hearing. Uh, there were people from Veterans for Peace, myself included. There were people from Sunrise, uh, from um, other local organizations. And um, we found each other. The, the, the hearing was the first we'd heard. The thing had been in process for a year and a half under non-disclosure agreements, right? It was a secret deal. So um, we found each other. We formulated a plan to stick together, uh, called ourselves Reject Raytheon, got some social media rolling, got a website, and have been out in the streets doing all kinds of various actions uh, for over two years now. Um, Pretty faithful group. We have, when we show up in the streets, we can get 40 to 50 people, young and old alike. And um, our core group is probably closer to 20 people that meet together and plan together. But that's still pretty good for a city the size of Asheville. Um, you know, our resistance to this plant is uh, not just because of the plant itself. I mean, it's just about finished. They're about to go in production. But it's the plant as representative of the entire military industrial complex, uh, which, you know, worms its way into our communities and, you know, promises jobs and promises economic development, but that never really pans out, you know, wherever they get themselves into a community. So um, we want to keep educating people about the nature of that plant and the local 1% person, uh, Jack Cecil of Biltmore Farms, has another 900 acres that he wants to devote to basically a hub, an aerospace hub, uh, industrial park. He gave 100 acres to Raytheon for this Pratt & Whitney plant, and now he has another 900 acres. So we're focusing on that uh, and trying to highlight that for the public, that that's what's coming, not just this Pratt & Whitney plant. You know, during the uh, George W. Bush shock and awe war on Iraq, that began in 2003. I was watching C-SPAN one night and they had a speaker on there, Thomas Barnett, at that time was an instructor at the Naval War College. And he'd written a new book called The Pentagon's New Map. And his primary message uh, to the audience, it, they said it was Pentagon and CIA people in the audience, was that we're not gonna have jobs in America anymore. Our, we're going to move our industries overseas. And our role under corporate globalization of the world economy, he said, will be security export, which to me means endless war. So what you just described, building a, a plant there for Raytheon, and now this guy's got 900 more acres he wants to put for other in, military industrial work, it really indicates that the only jobs that the government the U.S. government is creating anymore are war jobs. And that's why we see this unity between the Republicans and Democrats scratching around on their knees, always begging for more money, because that's the role they've decided. We're going to be Mr. Big. We're going to be uh, Mr. Warmonger uh, around the world to back up corporate uh, takeover of the planet. That's that's really it. It's really sad. Uh, you've been a busy guy because uh, a year ago then you organized this national war, uh, you, you and others uh, began organizing this national uh, war industry resistors network. Talk about how it got started and what you all have been doing. Yeah. So um, 
Reject Raytheon is a local group, right? We're just here in Asheville. And we uh, were offered the opportunity to do a workshop for Veterans for Peace at their annual conference, which we did. And uh, during that workshop, somebody said, you know, there's lots of local organizations like yours in Asheville and uh, around the country that are opposing different tentacles of the war industry, Lockheed, Martin, Northrop, Grumman, you know, all of them, Boeing. And uh, you ought to network together and have a, you know, a national network so you can talk to each other, plan together and do things together and communicate. And uh, so that was a great idea. And uh, I started calling people that I knew around the country and those people called other people. And, you know, before you know it, we've got uh, at this moment, we have 38 different groups around the country that are local in nature that are all, you know, trying to do something to raise public awareness, to resist the local iteration of the war machine. Um, so we've been around for a year. And uh, we uh, we get together with, you know, we meet each other online on Zoom meetings and uh, periodically. And we also have had uh, joint actions last year. We had a week of actions that we all did around Earth Day and Tax Day and uh, talking about doing it again this year. Um, every month we have a webinar. And so uh, that's probably our main outreach to people around the country and world. We have people come onto our webinars which typically have something like 200 people on them at a time. And, um, you know, we're, we're highlighting different aspects of the uh, military industrial complex. And it, that's included the media, it's included think tanks, uh, not to mention the corporations themselves. It's included our culture, how uh, the military industrial complex, you know, uh, is in Hollywood and, you know, all the flyovers over, you know, NFL games and all that stuff. Um, we have one. We just our last one was with uh, what's called the uh, Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal, which is going to be uh, an initiative over the next few months. And the tribunal itself is going to happen in November, which is holding to account four of these war corporations. It's, uh, let's see, it's Lockheed Martin, it's Raytheon, Boeing and General Atomics. So um, so WERN, we call War Industry Resistors Network, WERN, W-I-R-N. We're uh, collaborating with that group to, uh, we just did the webinar that kicked off their campaign and um, we're gonna be doing other stuff with them as we go along too. So, so Wern has a nice high profile and we have a big mailing list. We have like 1600 people on our mailing list. And um, it's an attempt to uh, bring people together of, of grassroots organizations. I mean, we're supported by national organizations like Code Pink supports us. We're, our, our website is on the Veterans for Peace platform. Uh, World Beyond War supports us. Um, Mass Peace Action supports us. So we have national groups supporting us, but the uh, organizations themselves are local. And that's one thing I wanted to say about, Bruce, what you mentioned about uh, you know, the jobs and how uh, that's the only industry that the federal government has now is that uh, the, you know, it's also local and state that are in this game as well. Mm -hmm. And when they look for jobs, uh, you know, our state, North Carolina and our city, you know, we know you can get more jobs, you know, the cost of war projects and other research has shown that you can get more jobs if you invest economic development money in almost anything else, you know, health, education, infrastructure, clean energy. But, um, you know, the go-to, and it's, you know, because of political and financial pressure, is at the state and local level is um, these jobs, these uh, defense contractor jobs. And of course, they want themselves in every congressional district, of course. And um, yeah, so it's not just the federal government, it's also the local is in um, thinking only one way about jobs. Yeah, it's a good point you just made. Uh, and it really indicates how the military industrial complex, at least in my mind, has taken over not only Washington, but as you say, the states, the state legislatures, the even counties and cities where they're giving money. Here in Maine, we've had a big fight a couple times trying to stop General Dynamics, which owns Bath Ironworks, from getting more tax breaks from the state of Maine. A couple of years ago, they asked for a $60 million tax break from a, from a poor state like Maine. That's a lot of money. 
and uh, we fought it. We had a statewide campaign, and we were able to cut 15 million from it. They ended up getting 45 million, but uh, but it was a good campaign. But it really indicates how the uh, military-industrial complex is draining uh, the, uh, the the national treasury and then the state and local treasuries as well. It's really an insidious program. Uh, what is the website of uh, WIRN? Uh, what's the? Uh... Yeah, it's on on the Veterans for Peace website. And so if you go to veteransforpeace.org slash W, or I think it's um, action, take action, uh, veteransforpeace.org uh, slash take action slash WIRN. Okay, good. Uh, what have you learned uh, from this uh, WIRN? Uh, give, give me one or two things that really stand out for you that, uh, that you've learned over this process. Uh, let's see. First, I might say that um, there's a lot of us. <laughs> We're all over the country. And, uh, you know, by getting together, it sort of mitigates this feeling of being alone and fighting a, you know, feudal battle against this monster of the military industrial complex. So, um, so it is kind of eye opening to see that all over the world, really, because we have people come in from, you know, Australia and Canada and the UK and other countries as well. Um, that we're not alone. So that's the first thing. Uh, second is that people are active. They're doing things. I mean, they don't always tell Wern about it, but we find out about it in our conversations. Um, you know, we here in Asheville know what we do. We, you know, show up every couple of weeks or so, and, you know, we're, we're keeping ourselves alive and, and, you know, in good spirits doing that. But, you know, having a national network, helps understand that we're really part of a national movement of resistance because you're never going to see it on mainstream media, right? We have to create our own media sources. Um, so that's, that's important stuff. And the other thing that I, you know, knew intuitively, but I'm learning a lot about as we do these webinars is the extent and the pervasiveness of this war industry, just about every aspect of our society you know, whether you, regardless of what you look at is um, is uh, contains the kernel of military uh, influence, whether it's because of direct money and oversight or it's because of, you know, cultural, uh, I don't want to say propaganda because of what people believe in uh, that, you know, they're supposed to do this stuff. But uh, just about everywhere you look, uh, you can say, well, let's let's dig down in education. I was an educator, right? I was a teacher. You just dig down a little bit in the curriculum and you look at what, you know, sort of the unspoken agenda in classrooms and schools. You're not only patriotic, but uh, you cannot speak against the military and so forth in those those settings with kids or, you know, even with adults in universities that much anymore. Uh, so it's something to understand about the, all the various aspects that the military industrial complex is involved in. Well, this, uh, it's a good point you just made. And it makes me wonder how do we really even know, like you said, there are many of us in this country and around the world, but how do we collectively make an impact on our governments that are, have been taken over by the, by the big money, you know, by wall street, the military industrial complex, how do we make an impact on the media that is really run by these same neocons uh, and, and their interest and their ideology, their agenda is what we hear about in the media. Uh, and hell, we, I, you know, I can't even get a letter to the editor published anymore. I used to be able to years ago have them anytime I wanted uh, in the paper. But uh, so what do you think? Uh, what's your sense of how we're going to get out from behind this eight ball that we're behind today? Yeah. Yeah. The impact question, you know, I get that all the time and I worry about it all the time. Um, yeah. I, you know, on the one hand, I'm going to keep doing whatever I'm doing. And a lot of us are going to keep doing whatever we're doing without respect to impact because it's the right thing to do. You know, it's a matter of conscience to stand up and resist wars and militarism and racism and, you know, economic devastation and a threat of nuclear war, all of that. You know, it's about, you know, who are you going to be in this moment in time? So, so on the one hand, I, you know, I sort of uh, 
put the question of impact to the side because I'm, you know, I don't want to, I can't really justify that we're doing this because we think we're going to change this monster machine. On the other hand, I do have hope that we can make an impact and we have made impacts in small ways. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, the, the amount of impact people had back in the 60s with, and 70s with the Vietnam War. And I think you have to say we did. But of course, this day and age is different because, you know, we're so inundated with propaganda every which way you look. They control the media. Um, you know, they don't have the war on the screen anymore. And, and everything anybody ever hears is, you know, how we're the good guys. And, uh, you know, this is a just war. You know, we're only defending democracy or freedom. So it's a tough sell. You know, when you're out there on the street to, you know, help people understand the role of the United States and imperialism in the world. But that's what we've got to do. And the more we do it and the more of us that do it, you know, there's going to be impact. I believe we're going to have impact in the local arena. I mean, I don't know if we're going to, you know, change the monster machine up in Washington, D.C., but, you know, enough of us in the local area. My only hope is that, you know, bits and pieces will do something. So, uh, yeah, I don't have a specific plan that it's, this is how we do it. And I don't know if I did, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was an excellent answer, actually. I, I appreciate that answer a whole lot. And I'm sure the people listening also appreciate it. Um, let's go to this question. What are folks that you work with, either locally or nationally through through a uh, WERN? And you call it WERN or? WERN. WERN. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Rhymes with uh, so what are folks that you're working with saying about the U.S. NATO proxy war in Ukraine, which to me, uh, very well, as you already alluded to, could be a trigger for World War III. I mean, to, as far as I'm concerned, it's already World War III. Um, and uh, so what, do, you know, what, what are people saying about this? Uh, what's their analysis? Uh, are they concerned about it? Are they even talking about it? Oh, yeah, people are talking about it. Um, worried about it, for sure. People in my circle, that's what you're asking about, right? Our activist peace, peace workers circle. Um, you know, most people will all agree that we want peace and we want negotiations now, right? Not for the continuation of the war. Um, after that, it's a question, it's a mixed, mixed bag. Um, I, I have to say not everybody does all the homework that you do, Bruce, and I do to try to really understand and analyze, you know, what it is that's going on here. And, uh, you know, there are some people who think, you know, that what we have to do is continue to send arms to Ukraine. And, um, you know, I, of course, speak against that. And I can't even understand that if you're in favor of peace, that you would favor more arms going to Ukraine. But, you know, that's the propaganda we're drinking these days. So it's, you know, it's people who sometimes don't see through it. Um, the other issue that I think people really don't understand is, um, you know, all this propaganda about Putin being the madman and the crazy guy and being the aggressor and all this being, you know, it's an illegal invasion and all that is, um, it really misses the point and actually is a, um, it's misguided and it's a misconception because uh, as almost always, in this hegemonic unipolar war world that we live in, the U.S. has been the aggressor. The U.S. and NATO, you know, you can start the clock even before 2014 with RAND studies and, you know, go further back and you'll see that we have planned and targeted Russia and circling them with bases and circling them with, you know, nuclear weapons and, you know, trying to break them down into, you know, balkanize the country. And they know that it's about regime change. And the people in Russia know that. And people in China know that too. Actually, probably most of the people around the world know that the U.S. has in mind global supremacy and Russia and China stand in the way of it. And Ukraine was picked intentionally. And you can look at the 2014 coup, but like I say, you can go before that. And how we've taken over Ukraine 
so that really it's not a sovereign government anymore. People say we want to protect sovereignty. You know, well, don't look at Ukraine for sovereignty or for that matter, even democracy and freedom. You know, it is one of our puppet governments now and we control it. And, you know, we stop any peace agreement that might be in the works between Russia and Ukraine, as it was within the first couple months of the war. Boris Johnson went there on behest of NATO and the U.S. and said, nope, not going to have a peace agreement. We want this war. We think this is in our interest. It's the U.S. that could stop this war whenever it so chose. So to point the finger at Russia and say Russia bad, especially for those of us who live in the U.S., it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Let's look at the U.S. as the perpetrator and continuer of this war, of this war and its global conquest ideas. So that idea is not well understood amongst our peace groups, although the conversation, we're having that conversation. You know, uh, you and I recently were talking and you brought up Bullwinkle, Boris Badenov. And it really underscores how in America, you and I, we're about the same age, our entire life, we've been taught that the Russians are bad. The Russians are evil. We are exceptional. We are the greatest. God blesses us. And that's really uh, what keeps, I think, a lot of people from being able to see the full picture. You know, when the collapse of the former Soviet Union happened in the early 90s, uh, Gorbachev was the leader of Soviet Union at the time, and he was asked to allow or support the reunification of Germany, both East and West, because it had been divided during the Cold War. And so he agreed under one uh, uh, under one condition, and it was that NATO not expand towards Russia. And so he was promised by uh, Secretary of State Jim Baker, working for Daddy Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, who was president at that time. Uh, Gorbachev was promised that NATO would not expand. But then when Bill Clinton was president, he began what he called uh, NATO enhancement. And since that time, NATO has been on steroids, moving right up to the Russian border and including war games constantly along in Ukraine and other places. And you know, at the same time, uh, the West wants the Arctic because uh, of climate change and the melting of Arctic ice. Soon you're gonna be able to drill baby drill up in that region. And they want to balkanize. They want to break Russia into smaller countries so they have access to the Arctic. And on the day that the uh, what Russia calls the special military operation began on February 24th, that very same day, the U.S. and NATO began a war game called Cold Response on the Norway-Russia border, right on that border where, the, where those two countries meet. So it's clear to me what's really driving all this madness. Just today, I learned that uh, the uh, Ukrainians military dropped chemical weapons on Russian troops in the Donbass who were trying to clear the Nazi-led Ukrainian army out of that area, uh, dropped it on their soldiers with a drone, with drones. And it, it, finally, I want to say this before I let you uh, finish up with closing comment. Um, Russia's military budget this year is about $80 billion dollars as compared to the US, which is up when you add up all the various pots of gold that are hidden, it's about a trillion dollars a year. You add NATO, NATO spending to that, it's huge. So Russia's military is not an offensive military. Those that say Russia wants to uh, take Ukraine and then move on and take the rest of Europe, they're lying. Uh, Russia couldn't do that on an $80 billion a year military budget. Okay, we got about a minute left, 45 seconds left. You want to make a closing comment? Yeah, let me say, just to follow up on what you're talking about, I hadn't heard about that chemical weapon thing. And I've been thinking over and over again about we can expect a false flag anytime now from the U.S. and NATO, and it might be a chemical attack. So, um, you know, ouch, I, I hate that. Um, final comment is, I, you know, a pep talk to everybody that uh, we can do stuff locally. 
you know, like reject Raytheon here is in Asheville. And uh, if you see something local that has the potential of, you know, gathering people together and resisting this war machine, you know, send us, send us a note at WERN at uh, War Industry Resistors Network. Uh, come to one of our webinars. Uh, just go on our website and you can see, you know, a link to the webinar and you can see an email you can send us. And, uh, you know, we got to get together here and fight this thing. Thanks, Ken. Great to have you on the show. Thanks, and thank Ken. you for watching another edition of Space Alert. We'll do another show next month with another movement leader from a different part of the world. Until then, good luck to you all and please get organized.